Amen. It's good to be here in church. I want to invite you to sing along with us, sing these songs. Amen. God be glorified.
service. Amen. Let's take a minute to go before the living God. Amen. And make requests. Amen. Let's pray for our leadership. Pastor Greg and Lisa Mitchell. We're going to pray for the uh, Morales, uh, Jesse and Bethany. Let's pray for uh, the Cassio, Stephen and Emily. Let's also pray for the hearts. Amen. Uh, Chris Hart and Paula, his wife. Let's also remember to pray for the Spanish pastor, Diego and Kelly Galvan, who are laboring faithfully in our grandmother church in Prescott, Arizona. Let's believe God for miracles to be released into their service tonight. Backsliders reclaimed. Let's believe God for miracle healings and power to be released in the preaching of his word. Let's pray also for Paul and Linda Campbell, the Ganeers. 
faithfully laboring in Cape Cod, the Suspanskis, the Kings, and the Spicers in Jacksonville as well, and also my pastor, Pastor Keith and Carrie Sullivan in Rochester, New York. Let's pray for the Brighton campus. Amen. That God does miracles tonight, touches young lives, stirs people to revival, to know that he is available, that they have a big part in the move of God. Let's believe God for revival here in Greece. We're going to pray for uh, Unsuk and Juanita. Let's also pray for Mario and uh, Brother Javon. Amen. Our policemen, firefighters, and active military, that God would overshadow them and their families. We're going to pray for uh, Miguel Nieves. Amen. And let's pray for Leon Fuller, Joseph DiPaolo. Amen. And uh, all those who are recovering from sickness. Let's believe God for uh, all the churches here in uh, New York and Rochester, working here in Greece to uh, be ready for Jesus Christ when he comes to be evangelizing, to be knit together as one body, amen, that we can have uh, dominion here as we preach the gospel. Let there be a mighty move of God. Let's yes. pray and believe God together for your prayers. Perhaps there's a need in your life that you're not mentioned. Uh, you're sick in your body or you have a financial need. You want God to move, amen. Praise God. We're going to pray for you if you're online. And believe God for your soul, your salvation, your family, your loved ones, your children, and uh, your extended family. Salvation be wrought in your life, especially tonight. Amen. I'm going to ask David to open us up in prayer and uh, believe God for miracles in Jesus' name. Let's pray. God, I pray for Reggie right now. God, touch his life. Minister to him, Lord. God, draw him into this fellowship, into the power of God. Be released uh, as he... Lord, God is making righteous decisions. God, I pray for all those on our prayer list. God, you hear from heaven. God, I believe you are going to move. Lord, God, there's none like you, God. Equip us, empower us, God. Let your presence fall in this service tonight, Lord, God, like never before, God. Satisfy every longing heart. God, breathe the Holy Spirit upon us. Answer every prayer, Lord God. We're longing for your return, God. But we know that there's a lot of work to be done, God. Saving souls. Getting as many in the boat as possible before you return, Lord God. Help us to have uh, that uh, uh, vibrancy in our own life. Anointing and power in us, Lord God. That we can believe you and call on your power. Dispensing your will into our lives, God. Make us a fruitful people, God. When you return, I pray in the name of Jesus, don't let us take our hands off the plow. Lord, don't let us lose our faith, our patience, Lord God, our vigor, we and know, Lord, uh, that the Holy Ghost moving in these upon last us, days, Lord God. God. Release God. Release God. God. We ask, Lord, that you clarify our eyes, Release clarify God. our ears, so that we can see what's going on, follow you and get the people to say we're going to be saved. It's obvious that uh, the world is running away from you as fast as they can. We ask, Lord, that you give us the grace to touch those who are willing to turn to you. So they can come back to you and you can add them to your bride. Shut them up. We ask you in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Oh, Take a minute to greet one another, make everybody feel welcome this evening. Praise God.
Amen. In our right minds, most of us, praise God, right? <laughs> Hallelujah. We know we're in the right place at least. This is where God has you, amen. And this is where God is going to use your life, amen. You can write that down and trust God with all your heart, all your life, amen. Uh, welcome to Grease Potter's House. We're so glad that you're here. We are, amen, excited about what God is doing, amen. We have our second service this evening, a different sermon that God has given me to preach. And I want to invite you to uh, come back, amen, on Wednesday night. We have a midweek service at 7.30. 6.30 is our time for prayer. Sunday morning, we will be here at 10.30 if you're online and unaware of that. Amen, we're located in the Toys R Us Plaza. We have an evening service at, at 5.30. We pray, we get a hold of God, you know, because uh, prayer works. Amen, if you believe that, shout amen. 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 Praise God, we're gonna... Uh, look forward to what God is doing this weekend. We're also going to be outreaching on Saturday at 11 o'clock if you'd like to be with us. Amen. At this church building, we'll be meeting here and we'll be going into different neighborhoods. We see many people that come to church are invited by a flyer and by, you know, somebody going. There's always somebody that has to go. Amen. And uh, we're thankful that we see fruit from our neighborhood outreaches. We go door to door. No, we are not Mormons. Sorry, we are not Jehovah Witnesses. Amen. I saw a little clip on uh, my uh, next door, and people were complaining about the Mormons who showed up on Thanksgiving Day. Oh, man. So they thought they were Jehovah Witnesses, and they're not supposed to celebrate holidays. I don't know about the Mormons, but amen. We are not Mormons. We will go. We will keep going until Jesus returns. Amen. Because that's what he's commanded us. Let's take our offering, uh, changing the order of our service. This is uh, called Offerings to Sacrifice from the same book of Exodus as we've been studying for the past month. Then Pharaoh called to Moses and said, go serve the Lord. Exodus 10 verses 24 through 26. Go serve the Lord. Only your flocks and your herds be kept back. He's releasing them from slavery, but he's still got his finger on them. He's still trying to control them. Let your little ones also go with you. But Moses said, you must also give us sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Our livestock also shall go with us, nor a help shall be left behind. For we must take some of them to serve the Lord our God. And even we do not know with what we must serve the Lord until we arrive there. Amen. God gives you your job so that you can make an offering to God. Amen. The devil uh, is always portrayed in the scripture in the uh, book of Exodus, the, the Pharaoh, the king, is always ruling over the people and controlling them. But here we understand that now they are free. And God gives us a what to sacrifice. Let me ask the usher to come forward and take our offering. Amen. As honoring God. Amen. God gives us jobs and he gives us money so we can worship him. He provides for us so that we can make an offering. Amen. Let's give that we've been set free. <laughs> Just playing with you. That God is here, amen. He's helped us and we can give because he has been faithful. Let's be faithful to give. Amen. Brother Dave, will you bless the offering? Yeah, Lord, we thank you for the true fact of what Paul just said is true. You have always been faithful to us. Yes. You have always taken care of us. The only thing that happens is we don't trust him. If we don't trust him, then you don't bless us. But as long as we trust, you bless us. And we thank you for that, Lord. And we thank you for the opportunity to give. We thank you, Lord, that we can trust you to take whatever we give and multiply it and get people saved, get people yes. healed. Amen. Get people delivered. Amen. In the name of Amen. Amen. Thank you for your offering and your giving. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you for your faithfulness. Give, give us a fast one, honey. Give me a fast song. You live the life that I should have lived. You got the death 
that I should have died. God in my place was crucified. Thank you. Thank you for the cross. It was your blood that saved me. Thank you for the cross. It has the power to raise me. Thank you for the life you gave. My Savior in my place. Sing it, thank you. I'm singing, thank you. Oh, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the cross. Amen. Perfect. Thank you, musician. And those laboring on the platform, we uh, greatly appreciate your help on the computer. Amen. And your prayers as you have prime this service as you have been yearning for God to move in your life. Amen. God is here this evening. He wants to uh, give something to you. He wants to depart something in your soul tonight. And I'm excited to preach this sermon that I've entitled The Great Experiment. And then Isaiah 65, 5 says, God meets with those who remember his ways. And telling stories of former revivals can help spark expectant hearts. After all, this isn't just about a peace sign and nostalgia fest for old baby boomers. I'm going to talk about this uh, Jesus people revolution, the move of God where uh, Jesus was saving all these hippies back at the end of the 60s. Amen. When there was war, there was protests. There was all kinds of uh, drugs and immorality was rampant, but there was uh, a, a loosing of the Spirit of God in our country, and we saw this manifest in this following illustration here. <coughs> Excuse me. It's all about the wheel of faith as it turns and the surprising ways which God can make it new and fresh in our own time. For such a time as this, when you and I have been brought to a place, an intersection of time and our lives and what God is going to perform here at Grease Potter's house, amen, it just takes a little spark of faith. And as we believe God, we're going to see the tide change. Let's make it fresh tonight. Let's believe God for a whole new generation that are in search of a revolution. A whole new group of people, not only young people where most revivals uh, flow through, but also people here in Greece, amen. People that are desperate. Isaiah 64, 5 reads, You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continue to sin against them, you are angry. How then can we be saved? Amen. That's not the scripture yet we're doing. Oh. No, that's just a little primer for us. Amen. When God is remembered, when we put God in the forefront of our thinking, we're able to uh, look how we can be used. We're Throughout the day, throughout the week, we're looking for opportunities to speak about what God has done for us personally. We're reminded of what God has done in times past so that people now in the present can experience what we experienced. Hallelujah. The miracles that changed us. Amen. The things, the supernatural things that we experienced that were mind-blowing. Miracles will occur when we pray. And when we seek God with all our hearts, then He responds. He has no other choice. This is His dream. This is His desire. He wants to move in the earth and show Himself strong. And we're going to look at this this evening, amen, in Acts 12, verses 5. And then we're going to read Acts 12, verses 12. This is all about... The prayer that was given for Peter, amen, in the book of Acts. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. 
And then verse 12, when this had dawned on Peter, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people were gathered together and were praying. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for scripture, God. We thank you for past experiences. We want you to give us revelation tonight about prayer, God, to adjust our thinking, to help us to limit our time and our framework to a life of prayer, life laid down in prayer, amen, seeking you. Yes. Thank you for your presence, the great experiment. Amen. Prayer works, you know. I'm going to read this for a little while until it's time to stop reading it. But this was an actual account of the dean or the president of the college that I'm referring to from 1970. It's called Ashbury College. It's a Bible college, and some of you might be yawning already. But I want you to think about this in Kentucky. It was a seminary where six students had banded together to commit themselves to faithful praying every morning for 30 minutes, study the word, talk about it, and believe in God for the revival. He starts off by saying this. He says, uh, uh, one of the things that we realized was our great need. And he confesses, we are so desperate without the living God, without our Lord and Savior. We desperately had a condition of barrenness, Amen. That might be you this evening. Amen. But God honored them and honored me in his infinite mercy. And another thing happened. We had some students that were hungry for God. He says here, they were interested in prayer. One yet late young lady in particular became so deeply concerned for the blessing of God on our campus. She gathered together a group around her. And they started praying in October. That was three months before the manifestation, before the Spirit came in February. Six students banded together in what they called the Great Experiment. They covenanted together for 30 days to take 30 minutes every morning in, in the time of prayer in the morning and reading the Bible and, you know, this is extra. And then uh, write things down and, you know, share this with everybody. They had a commitment to one another. They were accountable to each other, checking up on each other to see if each had done the disciplines that they had promised for 30 days. At the end of 30 days, they came forward at the end of the fall term. Amen. The beginning of the winter term, each one of those six picked up five extra people to pray with them, to spend time with God. And so the experiment ended on the 30th of January. On the 31st of January, they held a chapel service. And there were 36 of them on the platform. And those 36 students who were involved in the great experiment began to testify about what God had done in their lives. Amen. They were just sharing what God had done. The next chapel service for the students was on the 3rd of February. Now, in addition to this, the young lady I told you about in her group, she had gone to the proper authorities, asked for a chance to have a place to have her prayer service. Amen. It was called Hughes Auditorium. And they prayed all night. Amen. At 2.30 in the morning, they all gathered up at the altar and they held hands together. And they, after every time in their prayer service, they would say, is he coming? Is he, is he going to be, is he here? Will he show up? They're talking about Jesus because they're waiting for this manifestation. And at 2.30, they all agreed in prayer. They said, he's coming. There was no question about it. And they decided to go home. They went to bed. Secured in their minds that Jesus was coming to the campus. They asked each other, he'll come today? They were questioning each other, they were looking for it. They were 
They were excited about what God was going to do. They finished their prayer meeting. Amen. And they settled in their heart. He's coming. That's what faith can do. And he did just that. The following service is when their revival happened in that college. Amen. You need God to move, amen, in your life. And I'm sure of it because I'm just like you, just as desperate. I want to see God move. I want to see God help my family. I want to see my kids raised up. I want to see miracles occur. I want to see blind eyes opened. I would like to see, amen, uh, people get saved that are completely lost, that are unchurched. People that are, you know, completely without God. People crazy. People in insane situations. Amen. And I want you to have this desire with me. And look at how Peter was in jail. There was no getting out for him. And he was scheduled to be murdered. Because, amen, King Herod had arrested others in the church other people that belong, verse 12. And he intended to persecute all of them. He had James, the brother of John, killed or put to death with the sword. When he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. And this happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting Peter, he put him in jail, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of Four soldiers each in Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. Peter, here in our scripture, was going to be killed and made him uh, an example of. This is a pretty serious situation. There's people here, maybe you're listening online, or maybe you're sitting in one of these comfortable blue chairs in our sanctuary, and you have a desperate need in your life. You have some serious problems that you are up against, personal issues. Amen. There's things that are working in your life that are more like a curse than anything else. A way of thinking. Or maybe you're in bondage to something. Maybe you're in, uh, addicted to a substance. Fentanyl is very popular nowadays. Or alcohol, you can buy it on the sh shelves. Anybody can get it. Or there's things in your life, you have sexual perversions, you have things and addictions that, that you never thought you would be involved in at one point in your life. And now you are locked up, baby. There's no getting out without a miracle. And just like Peter, Peter's about to be put to death by the sword. Just like James. The early church realized that nothing good was going to happen without prayer. And so Jesus taught them as his disciples were in the habit of praying. Amen. And as they realized that Peter had been nabbed and was locked up, they had a prayer service. And they met in somebody's house and began to lay a hold of God for his mercy for this situation in particular. Amen. In the house of Mary, this describes the mother of John Mark. Amen. There's many people that live in Greece here. They're just like sinners behind bars. They've been given a, an unfair trial. They're in bondage now. They're locked up. They're in shackles. They can't be free. Amen. They're just sinners. They have no hope. There's no help for them. There's no program. There's no drug or medication that they can get on. There's no new relationship that they can get involved in. There's no drug that will ever satisfy that or heal that broken heart. No one will be freed from shit, from sin, excuse me. No one will be set free from the jailhouse of that sinner's lifestyle. That without a miraculous intervention. So that's why you and I are inclined to pray. That's why you and I are called to lay hold of God's promises and watch what he can do. He's preparing things in the heavenlies. It's behind the scenes. We, we're not aware of it. It's something that's just out of sight. It's not hidden from us. Although we know his promises, I know that he's promised to give us fruit. He says, uh, John 15, 16, uh, you did not choose me, but I chose you. 
and that's to go and bear fruit and that your fruit will remain and whatever you ask in my name I will do it for you that fruit includes a fruitfulness in winning souls a fruitfulness in a godly example a godly mouth a godly lifestyle that you have amen God is doing things behind the scenes right right outside the door it's like he's He's working things right outside the door here. We're not aware of it. We can't see it. It's held back from our vision, but we know he's done it before. We know that it's his plans, and he's just waiting to jump in to this reality here. We can't comprehend what he's doing, but we know his desire is to bring revival as his was in the Ashbury Bible College revival of 1970. Why? Because that's his will. He loves people. He loves to save. He loves to work his work. He loves to show up. He loves to save and forgive. And we see that he has promised us this and that he will bring it to pass. Amen. When life becomes desperate, God shows us, secondly, that if we pray, he will answer he promises to move. We really don't have to wait till horrible things start happening to us. How many times have you uh, been in debt or the car breaks down and, you know, all, all of a sudden you start praying or there's something horrible that happens. Somebody dies or somebody gets a disease or something of uh, catastrophic uh, condition, uh, proportions just begin to happen. So then that's when you start praying. You don't have to wait till then. You can pray now, even when things are seemingly going well, you can pray now and get a hold of God because through prayer, amen, God can move. It's like he has no permission to move until we pray. He's waiting for your mouth to start moving and your prayers to start flowing and flooding into his ears. It's like we give God permission. I mean, if, you know, if, Nobody wants him around. He doesn't get invited to Thanksgiving. Am I right? Or to the party. If you don't want God in your life, he's not going to show up. If, if you're uh, bucking him and he wants to come into your life and you're just like not interested. But it's a lot different when you say, God, man, I need you. Will you please help me? That's a different kind of a heart. That's a kind of condition that is welcoming the spirit of God. That he is, he's he's given, been given permission. He's ready to move. He's he floods into that heart and he washes and cleanses and heals and he empowers. Amen. In a moment's time, as we begin to pray, the desire of those students at Ashbury College, they had knitted their hearts together. They had become desperate. I think that there was some things going on the East Coast at the time. Previously, maybe 1958. Maybe 1959, there was a stirring, things were going on there. But this is in their lives. This is a desire for something to happen in their college when they saw nothing happening. They had a desire, a devotion, and a dedication to prayer that was unstoppable. To touch God and to let him touch them. Amen. Prayer is essential. Without prayer, nothing is going to happen. And then being in prayer, every great revival was seated with the lifestyle of habitual praying and seeking God and extra prayer services and extra praying and uh, um, sometimes prayer into the night on many occasions accompanied with fasting. People were looking for a change. Every great awakening, every stirring of the Holy Spirit comes when people are motivated. And God is motivated through prayer. God connects to people through prayer. And every young, uh, excuse me, every revival is fashioned through young people. Revival is generally associated with the younger generation. The old funny duds. Mm -hmm. 
the established older people who have, you know, jobs and cars and, uh, you know, they've got their career going, you know, they're essential. They're what we call pillars in building the kingdom of God. But it's the young people that get the vision and they carry it. And they bring people to church. Revival is associated with the younger generation. I mean, it's natural for old people to become religious, right? But it's supernatural when young folks, teenagers, 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds, young people, I mean, get a vision for what God is doing. It flows through them. Some of the kids didn't even want to leave the sanctuary where God was moving. Uh, I'm going to talk about how the, the spirit fell on those kids on the 3rd of February. But they said, like, they didn't even want to go home. I remember when I got saved, I said, man, when is the next church service? I want to be there. I want to be part of what God is doing. And God's presence in my life in that church in Potter's house in Rochester was so thick. I wanted to be on every outreach. I wanted to be where my pastor was. I wanted to be involved in, uh, if they were going out of town on a guerrilla team or making an impact team to the next city. I wanted to be there. And that's what these kids felt. They wanted to be in God's presence. They couldn't even leave that uh, auditorium. They didn't want to go home. The uh, president of the or the dean of the college came, he sat in the back when all this was going on and kids were repenting. And I'm going to get into that in a minute. But he said he was just watching there. And he said his wife didn't even want to go home and cook dinner for him. She wanted to stay there in the presence of God. That's how wonderful it was. Now, in addition to this, the young lady that I told you about in her group, she had the uh, proper authority. They were praying in Hughes Auditorium. A large group gathered around the altar. Amen. These students, they got it. They really began to discipline themselves. And uh, it was an experiment in a way, but the experiment proved to be true as they were putting God to the test. Amen. We see in scripture that there was prayer for Peter. Amen. Acts 12.5. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Mm. Is the church alive? Is it praying? Seeking God? Is the church anticipating the next great revival? Are we anticipating or are we calling on God to do what he loves to do. Amen. And that is to say, sure, one at a time, but also a, a movement. And, and that means multiplied people are going to be coming to this church, getting saved. Amen. Because of A, and A knows B, C, and D, and D knows E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, right? And all those people are connected together, amen, for a uh, flood of souls into God's kingdom and into this work. We've seen it happen before. It's happened countless times. Uh, it's happened here, amen. It's also happened in our mother church. It's happened uh, uh, throughout our fellowship, amen. Those people are called key conversions, and they know a lot of people. And uh, we see that prayer works when we are engaged in looking forward to what God is going to do and what only he can do. Is the church ready for what God can do? Or is the church like Rhoda? Rhoda was the young lady as Peter is released from jail. We're going to look at it in a minute here. I'm getting ahead of myself, but uh, Peter... He's released from jail miraculously. He's knocking on the door. Rhoda goes to the door. Who is it? It's, he says, it's Peter. He's like, she's like, oh, and she runs away. Like, instead of letting him in, she doesn't even realize 
what they're praying about. They're praying for Peter's release from prison. And here he is at the front door. Is the church ready in position to let those junkies and those hippies and those divorcees and those immoral alcoholics in the back of the church to come and sit next to us? Can I ask you that? Are you ready for that? Because when God does what God wants to do, we should not stand in his way. We should not object to it. Hold on, God. This is not what I planned. I'm not ready for this. But God will be glorified as we position our hearts to let him do what he wants to do. Hallelujah. Or will we be like the, the, the church that's looking for miracles? Amen. What would be saying? He is coming. Like those kids, when they looked at each other, they're done praying. Is, is he coming? Is he coming today? Right? They had that expectancy. They weren't sure. But that was the whole point of it. Looking for miracles. Yeah. Amen. Or will our jaws be on the floor when we see God fill every chair here and there's only standing room in the back where well, we have to lift our jaws up astonished at what God did mind boggling just blowing your mind what God can do amen Acts 12 12 when this had dawned on him he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, uh, where many people had gathered and they were praying. I'm not sure if this was an overnight prayer service in this lady's house, but the Bible says that they did it. And it's possible that we could do it also. We've had uh, different sign-up sheets in our mother church where people have signed up for, you know, uh, 12 to 1, or they're going to pray 1 to 2, or 2 to 3, and et cetera, et cetera. They sign up, and they wake up in the middle of the night, and they start praying. And there's prayer being given for the city that you live in all night long. And that's going to happen here one day. But are we a praying people? Are we gathered to pray in Jesus' name, like one man with one heart, like a unified effort. Is that the way we are? And God can move as we link our hearts together, as we believe God, call on his promises, and just trust him with our lives and with the town and with the city here. When we are gathered in Jesus' name, he is glorified. And lastly, repentance is necessary. It's one other element that is linked to revival. And in this revival, they stress the whole idea of uh, immediate obedience. When God told you to do something, the, the response was, God, whatever you want. And this is why the revival spread. One lady came to the dean and she said, I have to talk to you. This is in the middle of this revival that's happening. So they go downstairs and uh, he's there with her and she confesses to him, I'm a liar. He's like, oh shoot, okay. He doesn't know what to say to her. She's confessing that she's a liar. She says, I lie all the time. I enjoy it. I don't know how to control myself. And she says to him, what should I do? He's not sure what to do. But God gives him this thought. He says, go to everyone you have lied to and tell them. So she's like, ah, that's embarrassing. That's right. So she comes back weeks later. She says, you're not going to believe this. I talked to 35 people that I had lied to. And I'm finally free. That is revival. That is God moving. Obedience and prayer linked together bring this kind of revival. I want to close 
in the answered prayer, and that is Peter's release. Uh, verse 6 reads, The night before Herod was about to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. Do you think it was an LED? Probably the angel glowing there. An angel of the Lord appeared and a light showed in the cell. He struck Peter on the side of the head and said, Wake up! Get up quick! And the chains immediately fell off of Peter's wrists. So an angel smacks him on the head. Wake up! It's time to go. People have been praying for you. Do you realize this? And he's like, it, Maybe it felt like a dream, I imagine. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. He gets him some real details. The angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea what the angel was doing, was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. And it opened for them by itself. And they went through it. When they had walked the length of the street, suddenly the angel left him. He's all by himself. God has done something tremendous, some miracle in releasing him. The angel says, good luck, Peter. Peter finds the house. They're praying. Peter is spared from death and goes on to lead the church. Amen. He's astonished. And Peter keeps knocking on the door where they're praying in that prayer meeting. It's at somebody's house. And uh, they opened the door and they saw him. They were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. He said, tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this. And he left for another place. And then how else could this have happened without the Spirit of God, without the angel of the Lord showing up to wake him up and get him ready and open all these doors, you know, drop the shackles from his wrists, set him free. There was no small con commotion in the morning as the soldiers were being brought into account. Verse 18, Herod made a thorough search for him and did not find him. He cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. Amen. It's really going to happen. We shouldn't be surprised when God gives a miracle. We shouldn't be astonished when God brings people into this place for healing and miracles. Amen. We should be expecting the supernatural dimension that is going to be released by faith. The release of prisoners from hell's punishment and hell's torment. Many people living here in Greece, New York, that need a miracle, who want God's multiplied favor with conversions of both young people and older folks. You know, miracles are being prepared. They're on the way. And God is positioning himself, amen. He's dealing with people and he's going to orchestrate his will. Sometimes he removes people from a church so that he can open up other opportunities for other people to come. Amen. God does what he wants to do and I want to do what he wants me to do. There was a revival with thousands of people affected on February 3rd in their chapel service. A long line of students began to form as each waited his turn to tell what God had done in his heart. Students of all classes from freshmen to seniors poured out their souls asking forgiveness, exhorting others to heed the call of God. As the confessions were made, other students streamed to the front filling the altar in the front seats. One man made uh, an observation. He said uh, that uh, the, it was 
kind of amazing that the kids without any talent or any abilities that were not very uh, impressive, he said. He used that word. He said, those were the most anointed testimonies. Amen. That is you and I. We don't have much to offer God, but what we do have is, amen, our lives, our submission to his will and our obedience to him. And that's what I love about that statement. God can use anybody here. Amen. We went into the streets. We went everywhere. When we first got saved, we were so happy to tell people about Jesus. God uses, amen, all kinds of people to bring the revival in. Not many noble are in the church. Can you say amen? amen. Just regular folks like you and I. Amen. The intense divine manifestation continued about to the noon hour. One faculty member reported that he went to the dining hall for a scheduled divisional meeting when he found only a few diners in the ordinary place. And he came back to the chapel where the people were more concerned about the divine bread of heaven than for food for the body. This revival spread all throughout the United States, all different college campuses. At the time people were traveling, they were testifying. Uh, one testimony about these kids, uh, they were told by God, you need to go to this uh, church, ne Church of the Nazarene, I think it was, and tell, tell everybody what's happening at Ashbury. So they showed up there. The pastor had already planned there's an evangelist he had paid for. They also had a giant choir that was scheduled to sing. So the kids came there. They probably weren't looking all dressed up. They maybe probably in the their jeans that are all tore up and, you know, not, not very impressive. This is that, that state where that came from. And he's like, what do you want to do? And he said, we want to talk to the people. So he's like, geez, do I give my pulpit to these long-haired kids? You know, these kids that don't, you know. It's kind of a risk if you think about it. So God told him to do it. So he did. And, and, uh, so as uh, the, the kids are talking, they, one, he says, I'll give you five minutes. One kid stands up, and for about a minute and 12 seconds, he says, we were you know, all praying, and uh, very simply, God showed up in our, in our chapel service. He went and sat down. The other kid stood up. These guys aren't preachers. And he gave this you know, four-minute you know, explanation of what happened. He sits down. So the, the evangelist is sitting there waiting to do his job. The choir stands up. They all start singing, uh, and they get to the first chorus, and the bass says, stop. I'm not singing. I have to testify. I'm not right with God. And so he gets down off the, the bleachers there, and he comes down to the front, and he kneels down in the front and he starts praying. He starts crying out to God. The next person stands up. They come forward. This is what God can do, amen, through our simple witness, amen, as regular, unimpressive people. God can use your life. I am sure of it. This revival spread all over, amen, the United States. And uh, in closing... I want you to think with me for a moment here. Judgment begins in the house of God. When we get real with God, when we submit to him, confess our sins, and turn away from all the trappings of the world, God will show up and bring his spirit. Amen. 1 Peter 4, 17 through 19. This is the King James Version. For the time is coming that judgment must begin at the house of God. And it must first begin with us. Amen. What shall the end be of them who are not obeying the gospel of God? You know, God cleans house once in a while. Amen. God shows up, and we know that the great experiment proves that God is faithful, and God will show up in your life to help you. And, amen, a great revival is positioned and ready to start. The moment that you and I say yes to God. And then let's close our eyes and bow our heads and pray.
together, amen. Let's create an atmosphere of anticipation and worship and an anticipation of God showing up in our lives. Let's contend for an atmosphere of revelation to be given this evening. Something to spread firstly to our own hearts and then to all the people that you know as you go to them and you express God's love, your prayers have been heard. God is moving. Amen. God will use your life. And I want to speak to you if not saved. You're, you're not born again. You're not right with God. You're not doing His will. And He has great plans for you, but you have thrown them in the toilet. You said, no, I'd rather sin. I really want to do my own thing. The Bible says that that sin, the soul that sins will surely die. And this is what's been happening in your life. You do not have any success. You're depressed. Maybe you're anxious. You have no joy in your heart. Amen. You love to just sleep all day long. Or you're on some drugs or some kind of medication. And you have no idea what God is doing. The Bible says that we're all sinners. Each and every one of us. We are lost desperately in need of a Savior. And I want you to know and learn tonight that God loves you. He loves you. He's died for your sins. Amen. He's paid the price for all your disobedience and rebellion. And if you'll cry out to him tonight, if you will believe in your heart and confess with your lips, and that means pray with your mouth. God will save you. And God will begin something new inside of you. How many would there be tonight, at the sound of my voice, you're ready to make a change in your life? You're ready to turn away from your old and move forward in Christ. And then that's you. You want to get saved. Amen. Or you're backslidden. That means you're out of fellowship with God. You're not doing God's will. And you're on your way, amen, to a devil's hell. Perhaps unless you repent. The Bible says that uh, repentance gets God's attention. It teaches us. It shows us. It makes us right with God as we surrender to God and become obedient. Amen. One of the signs of that revival was that intense desire to completely and quickly and immediately obey God as he speaks into your life. And that's you tonight. You're not saved or you're actually with an uplifted hand. Amen. All across the sanctuary. Amen. That's you online, baby. God is dealing with you and God's brought you to this place, to this video, to this service and then so that you can pray with me. And you're ready right now. So I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and bow your heart and bow your head and say, Jesus, I am sorry for my sins and tonight I repent. I repent of backsliding. I repent of my sin, my drugs and alcohol, my immorality, my selfishness, my pride. Set me free from my old life. I ask you right now for a divine miracle. Change me this moment forever. I thank you for the blood. Wash me clean. Jesus' blood on the cross. So thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. I pray. Amen. Praise God. We're going to change the order now. Open up these altars if you'd like to come forward and pray for uh, a loved one or pray for God to move in your life to give you that cleansing that you need. Judgment begins in the house of God. And nobody's going to judge you. Uh, if you judge yourself, make a decision. I'm going to come clean. I want to live for God. I want to make my life count. I want to see the move of God that you prepared. Amen. We're going to pray. Amen. Sing this song. Thank you. Come those
that seed, that take root. Let it germinate, God. Let it produce much fruit, God. Let it grow and be nurtured, God, by your Holy Spirit. God, let your presence fall on those who that we have talked to. Thank you, Lord, that we can trust you to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.